Just one example for inequalities, for graphing inequalities. So, easy question. How do you know that this is an inequality, not an equation? It's got inequalities on it. All right. So it's an inequality. So radius between 1 and 2. So what does that mean? What We do have restrictions on theta over here. So just think about the radius is going to be 1 or more, or maximum of 2, minimum of 1. So if I just graphed this radius right here. So one thing to do when you're graphing, if you want to do something complicated, maybe pretend that it's simple. So throw away the angle part and just worry about the radius. So we get a good understanding of what does the radius look like. So I'm just going to do a more simple example. Graph 1, less than we go to R, less than we go to 2. So here is radius 1, R equals 1. Here is radius R equals 2. And I want everything in between. Mmm, donuts. <laughs> All right, anybody know the math word for this? That is good. That would be a, if it was solid, like an actual donut, that would be a torus. Annulus? Or the subtraction of two circles, big circle minus small circle, but this is called an annulus. Or a washer. That works too. Okay, like All right, so that's an annulus. Let's graph the angles now. Okay, pi over 4, easy to graph. That is quadrant 1. It's the halfway stop in quadrant 1. All right, 3 pi over 4. Easy to graph. That is a halfway stop in quadrant two. Good label pi over four. That angle will be three pi over four. All right, no restriction on the radius though. So there is no restriction on r. So r could be zero, r could be positive, or r could be negative. So if r is zero, we got the origin, so we, we can sort of shade the origin in. R is positive, where does that put us? I have to be between these two angles, so if R is positive, we get the upper triangle right here. Actually, let me fill this in with a different color. Let me fill in with blue. Now, how far up does this go? Forever. So it's not really a triangle because it's infinitely big right here. So one way to describe, I don't want to sit here and do arrows on every single blue line, but I think you get the point. I like that, it's enough. All right, so it goes on forever up there. Is that the entire graph of this for all possible R values? What type of R values did I graph here? Positive. Positives and zero. What about negative R values? Other side. So all the negative ones, are gonna, I still need the angle between these two, so the other part is going to be basically the mirror image down here. Because in tight. Oh, I'll just draw less blue lines. That'll be easy. So there we go. A sideways bow tie. Infinite bow tie. Very big bow tie. All right, questions on that graph? All right, so those are your first inequalities. Now we're going to graph the original problem, which was both need to be true at the same time. So my angles, still the same angles, but I also have to worry about the radius can't be everything. 
So you want to be careful, we're basically intersecting the two. Now I say basically because you'll see it's not quite the intersection of these two. Are we allowed to have negative radius? Nope. So that's that little bottom part, I don't need to worry about that because my angle has to be between pi over 4 and 3 pi over 4. So I'm not going to have any of this, uh, any shading below the x axis because I got the angle is restricted to be up near the top. And when our radius is only positive, I get nothing below the x axis. All right, so we need to figure out radius 1 to radius 2. So if I call this 1 and that 2, we'll say it's right about there, maybe there and there, and 1 and 2. I'm just doing my best to label 1 and 2 on here, so I'm going the same amount each direction. And then we're going to connect them together like this. And then we're going to use blue, keep it consistent, we'll shade with blue. Ooh, can I do cool drawing stuff here? Is there a fill? Oh, that's a drag. <coughs> Basic shapes, you don't even have an annulus. That's ridiculous. Oh, look at that. All right. Who cares? This is math class, not time for fun. <laughs> okay, so questions on that graph right there. So again, a good strategy to do overall, if you're like wondering how in the world do I graph both of these, just graph them separately. And then try to do your best to put them together. Now if you go way, way back to pre-calculus 1, do you remember the definition of a graph? It starts out with something like all points that satisfy the equation. So inequality, a graph of inequality, all points that satisfy the inequality. Or in this case, both inequalities at the same time. So let's do some conversions. We're going to we're going to convert I think we did a point already. Is that right? We converted points. If not, you can do that, I'm pretty sure. So we'll just go to straight to equations. So we'll just convert equations. I thought we converted a point. Yeah, we at least went one way. We went from we get, went from rectangular to polar, which is the hard part. Polar to rectangular is super easy. So I'm not going to do a polar to rectangular point. All you do, x is r theta, r cos theta, and y is r sine theta. It's not really worth our time doing that here, but we'll go to equations now and converting equations. So we're going to convert a polar equation to a rectangular equation. So we have four uh, formulas, which I'm pretty sure I wrote down before. X is r cos theta, y equals r sine theta, x squared plus y squared equals r squared, and tangent theta equals y over x. Now this early in the quarter, it's reasonable to put these on your cheat sheet. Hopefully you have these memorized, but your cheat sheet's not so full right now. You can put quite a bit of polar stuff on there if you need it. So we'll do our first example. So 
So to convert to polar, obviously we're going to use our polar conversion equations above. So that should be pretty obvious. So our goal is to take x and y, get them out of there, and replace them with some r's and thetas and probably trig functions as well. How do I get rid of x? Easy question. Yeah, r cos theta. So I see x just replaced by r cos theta. Now carefully do it. You're going to go r cos theta whole thing squared plus y minus 3, which is r sine theta minus 3 squared uh, equals 9. Do we have an equation? We got an equation. Is it a polar equation? Yeah. Yep, it's got r's and thetas, no x's and y's. So technically, we got a polar equation, and we've answered the question convert this to polars. We don't have to work very hard. This is the easy way to go. x is r cos theta, y is r sine theta. That's all you really need. What, if I graph this out, what, what would the graph look like just using your rectangular graphing skills? Circle, where's the center? Zero, positive three. What's our radius? Three. So remember, you're looking at radius squared, and uh, these are always the opposite of what it looks like. Or you can think what y value would make that zero. That's another good way to think about it. Three would make that one zero, and zero for x would make this one zero. So it's going to be a circle, center, Zero, three, radius, three. All right, so now we're going to do the hard conversion, which is the opposite. We're going to go from polar to uh, rectangular. Alright, ideas on converting this. I see an r cos theta. Yep, and what is r cos theta? So we got x right there. That's easy. Is r squared easy too? There we go. x squared plus y squared. So we don't have to work hard on this. Sometimes you have to square both sides. Uh, sometimes you don't. But this one, we already had r squared, so I didn't have to do um, anything on this. So we got x squared plus y squared. Can I borrow your pen? So. Thanks. The problem I should have done is this one right here. That would have taken one extra step. Multiply both sides by, you could square both sides, but then you're going to have, and r squared is just fine, but then you're going to have 16 cos squared, and there's not a great way to turn cos squared into x's and y's. But you multiply both sides by r, and then you're going to be right where we started. So if that was your original, you multiply both sides by r, then you got your r squared and your r cos theta, and then you're good to go. <coughs> oh, is that the end of 11.3? Wow. 11 4. 11.4 graphing in polar coordinates. What the heck did we just do? Maybe I graphed when I shouldn't. I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, 11.3 and 11.4 are pretty much the same thing. They're not, they're not that far off. Graphing and polar coordinates. I guess you can call it more graphing and polar coordinates, maybe. All right, symmetry. We didn't talk about symmetry, though. And then we'll talk about slope. And that's pretty much it.
through x-axis symmetry. You got a point up above the x-axis. If you have x-axis symmetry, you get a similar point just below the x-axis. So we have a theta and an r. What is one way to write the coordinates of the point on the opposite side of the x-axis? So there we go, r negative theta. So spin the other way. So that's theta right there. You go down here, uh, you have negative theta. And of course, you're still using the same r, negative theta. So here's our tests. Replace uh, theta by negative theta. What if I wanted to label this point with negative r? What angle would I need to use? So this is a little bit trickier. So if I go negative r, I need to point in the opposite direction. So I need to point this direction up here. What is that angle? So that'll be pi minus theta. So where does that come from? Go pi, and then come back theta. So just think reference angles. That's how you want to think about this. So go half rotation, and then come back theta. So go pi minus theta. So that'll be pi minus theta, and then we'll use negative r to go the other direction. So the other test we could do is we could replace theta by pi minus theta. And r by <coughs> negative r. So what, if I want to use r, what angle do I need to get the y-axis, the point with y-axis symmetry? So our first point was r comma theta. So I need the same r, but how do I get that angle? So we'll do, we're actually do exactly what we did the previous time. So we're going to go half a rotation, then come back theta. So we're going to go half a rotation, come back theta. So it's the same pi minus theta. Uh, you always have to start at zero. And what if we did that same sort of confusing thing of using a negative r? So let's get the opposite, the angle that points the opposite direction. So what is that angle that I just labeled? is negative, but not negative pi. Negative theta. That should be negative oh. theta. I think I meant what you knew. So that's negative theta. So another name for this point is negative r comma negative theta. So go the other way and then negative r.
So the easy way is replace uh, theta by pi minus theta. The hard way to go is replace Let's see, r by negative r, and at the same time, theta by negative theta. So the good news is origin is exactly, has two tests, but they're exactly what we saw back in pre-cal 2. So we saw both of these tests in pre-cal 2. <clears throat> so origin, I'm going to do a half a rotation around the origin. So I want to get the corresponding point over here. So how do I do half rotation? What do I do with pi? pi plus yep, add pi to it. So it would be pi plus theta or theta plus pi. I think we're writing them all as pi minus, so I'm going to write this as pi plus theta. Of course, addition is commutative, so I could just easily written theta plus pi. I just want it to look like all the ones above. They're all pi minus theta, so I'll just do pi plus theta instead. All right, so that's one name for the point. What is another name if I make r negative? This one does not require much thinking. Negative r, regular theta. So same angle, just go the other way. So we can either replace theta by pi plus theta, or you could replace r by negative r. So I'm not going to do tests for these. Uh, I will say that if you do want to test a re, uh, polar equation for symmetry, you're probably going to need the sum difference formula for sine or cosine. So you need to know like cosine a plus b, what that is, or sine a plus b. And that most likely will probably want to go on your formula sheet, at least in the near future, like your formula sheet for the first couple weeks of class till midterm one. There'll be a lot more polar stuff on your formula sheet the first part of class than there will be later on. You'll still have polar stuff later, but you'll whittle it down to uh, something much smaller. Slope. So if a polar curve is written r equals f of theta. So what type of polar curves are written like that? I think we just saw an r equals cos the four cos theta equation just before this. That was one of the ones that we uh, looked at. So that would be one written as r equals a function of theta. So that, uh, a really fast example, r equals four cos theta, uh, we said was a circle with a center and a radius and all that fun stuff. So. Here's one example of a curve like that. So what we want to do is find the uh, slope. The Cartesian or rectangular slope. Is dy over dx. Unfortunately, that's not r prime or df over d theta. So unfortunately, it is not just the derivative of your polar function. Yes, it certainly involves derivatives, but it's not the derivative of your polar function directly. All right, so what we have to do is compute this very carefully. Using doesn't have an e in it, does it? 
No. Okay. So we're going to use x equals r cos theta, y equals r sine theta. Now, what is r? If your curve is written, r equals f of theta, then x is f of theta times cos theta. So we said our curve, if your curve is written r equals f of theta, all I'm going to do is take r and replace it with f of theta up there. And y is f of theta sine theta. All right, so that is x and y. So what's dy over dx? If you look, everything has thetas in it. So I need to know I'm going to take an intermediate theta derivative instead. So what I'm going to do is rewrite this as dy over d theta divided by dx over d theta. So I'm treating the numerator and denominator the same, I'm dividing them both by d theta. So it's going to be equal. So what is dy d theta? So we got, and dx d theta. So we got x right here. So let's do our math over here. So x equals f theta cos theta, and I want to apply a d, d theta to this. So go ahead and compute this out. What rule do you need? Product rule, all right. <laughs> dx over d theta equals, what's the derivative, of, what is the theta derivative of f of theta? F prime theta. There we go, f prime theta. Yeah. Now, whatever f is, that'll change, f prime will change depending on what f is. So either way, f prime theta. All right, so product rule says times cos theta plus, what is the second part of the product rule? It's going to be f of theta, negative of theta sine theta is cos theta. So it would be f theta negative sine theta. So there's our product rule happening. <coughs> so of course we've got to do the same thing for r y equals f theta sine theta. So this is going to be super similar. Do it yourself. You should be able to knock this out in about 30 seconds. Maybe you already did if you saw it was coming down the pike. So go ahead and take this derivative. Once you have that derivative, you're ready to plug both of them into the slope formula here. Yes, just making sure you are paying attention.
No, let's carefully write it the right way. I think that just requires switching my trig functions, right? Oh yeah, that. Oh, so we have f prime of theta sine theta plus f theta cos theta denominator f prime theta cos theta minus f theta. Whew. All right, so here's a really good time to talk about uh, typos. So theoretically, you will catch all the errors I make. Practically, you won't. And even if you do catch every error I make, do you think all of you are going to write down everything that I write down perfectly? No. Some of you will make some errors some days. Uh, so there's a really good chance between my mistakes and your mistakes that what's in the box on your paper may not be true. There's probably like a 95% chance it's true. So when you actually make your formula page, uh, it could be my mistake or it could be your mistake, but I recommend use the textbook. The textbook is pretty solid for at least what's inside the boxes. There's occasional errors in the answer key in the sort of back appendix. Occasionally those are wrong, but I think overall that's really the only one of the few places there are errors. If you're actually absolutely obsessed with correctness, there you can always uh, look up, there's, I think they call it errata. It's the er erroneous, a collection of all the erroneous stuff in your textbook or at least all the, the collection of all the known errors of your textbook. So you print something that's 1,400 pages, there's guaranteed there's going to be errors in it. Um, there's a function that estimates the number of errors based on the number of words, but <coughs> believe me, there's more than one error in your textbook. Uh, if you're really obsessed, you can find that online. It's not too hard. Use Google. I think you have the 12. Make sure you had the right edition. You don't want to know the errors from the previous edition. That's not going to be very useful. So if you're completely obsessed, you can absolutely go and look at the errors from your textbook and all that. But I can say with pretty good confidence, everything inside of a box in your textbook is going to be right. So the type of error you would have is probably the type of error that you just saw me make. You know, you have to numerator, denominator, switch. That's a pretty easy error to make. Oh yeah, I'll give you a dumb answer. Um, is that the answer to the question, or is that a generic formula? Oh, I didn't ask a question. So uh, this is the slope, the Cartesian slope of a polar curve. So hopefully it will make sense on the next example. So graph a polar equation. So back in pre-calculus 2, did anybody not take my pre-calculus 2 class? Oh no. Oh, there's a lot of you. All right. Did you do polar graphing in polar coordinates? Yeah. You did? <laughs> you should have. Um, I know I d it takes a long time, so I did one quiz on polar graphing, and it takes like half an hour to graph it if you're not, if you haven't done it a lot. I think I remember that. That specific quiz. Uh, a lot of them were like cardioids, limacons. Circles are the easy ones. You can convert a circle to a rectangular and graph. Uh, I do not think this is a circle. Pretty sure this is a some type of a cardioid which generally they look something, oh geez, that's, they're either facing up, down, left, or right. That one's sort of lopsided. Mmm, pretzels, all right. 
So something like that. Um, some of the weird ones, there could be the rows, but those are way less common. We got that funky asteroid we just saw. Um, oh, the other ones, they look cardioid, heart-like, something like that. I think of it as a butt print in the snow, but <laughs> either way. So you're going to get some weird shapes like this. The overall shapes look something like this. Unfortunately, it takes a long time that I don't have right now. So go back to your pre-calculus 2 book and graph it out with these three steps very carefully. Where's a good place to check your graph? Desmos is good. Fuplot's good. Wolfram will give you a graph, but it's not, very, it's not the best graph. So you can get a graph on Wolfram, but I don't particularly like it that much. Yeah. It doesn't let you zoom. 